version of Blender, the standard depth of field effect doesn't work on grease pencils, but fortunately there's another way to achieve the same effect. In this video, I'll show you how. There are a few limitations though, so we'll also whip up a Python script that helps us get around some of them. In a typical 3D scene, you can apply the depth of field effect by simply enabling the depth of field checkbox on the camera. If your display is set to full render mode, you can then see the depth of field effect on the objects in your scene. But if we add a grease pencil object, you can see that they are unaffected by the depth of field. There is, however, an alternate method you can use to add depth of field to a grease pencil object, and that's with a shader effect. To see how this works, let's create a new 2D animation scene and get rid of any existing strokes. We'll zero out our camera to point down the y-axis and give it a long focal length, like 200 millimeters or so. We'll then add a new grease pencil Suzanne object by switching to object mode, and then going to add grease pencil monkey. We can then duplicate the Suzanne object five or six times and space them out in depth. To see the depth of field effect on these grease pencil objects, we can use a shader effect. Shader effects are like a post-process, where the object's representation is treated as an image to which you can apply a variety of effects. In this case, we'll use the blur shader effect to get our depth of field. To apply it, let's select a Suzanne grease pencil object, and in the properties window, click the visual effects tab. Next, we'll click the pull-down that says Add Effect, and we'll choose the Blur option. In the Properties settings, we can then check the Depth of Field checkbox. If your Suzanne Grease Pencil object doesn't look blurry after adding this effect, make sure you're in full render mode. And if it's still not blurry, make sure the Depth of Field options on your camera are turned on. And also make sure to check the settings. These settings behave just like a real camera, so you can increase the amount of the Depth of Field effect by either increasing the focal length or decreasing the f-stop. If we now add the same effect to all the grease pencil objects, we now have a reasonably convincing depth of field. If the blur looks too pixelated, you can also increase the sample's value to smooth it out. There is a significant drawback to this approach though. To demonstrate this, I'll select one of the closer grease pencil objects and then switch into edit mode. I'll then duplicate just the strokes and move those duplicate strokes to be at the same depth as one of the Suzanne grease pencil objects that's in focus. By moving the strokes back to within the focus range, they should also be in focus, but they're still getting the same blur as the closer object. This is because the effect computes the depth of field based on the grease pencil object's origin point, and not the position of the individual strokes. This means that if you want to have depth of field for individual strokes at different depths, they need to be in their own grease pencil object. Many people like to work in one grease pencil object with their strokes set to different depths, and if so, the depth of field might not work as expected in their scene. If that's the case for you, in the next section we'll cover how to write a Python script that helps us work around this limitation. This code allows us to slice up the grease pencil objects based on the depth of the strokes within it, and then put those into their own grease pencil object. And then it will automatically add the shader to each copy. If you're not a coder and just want the script, I'll add a link to the code in the description which you can download and run in your scene. But if you're interested to see how the code works, I'll spend the rest of this video breaking down the code. Let's start a new scene to test our script with. Like before, we'll zero out our camera and give it a long focal length. And next we'll delete any existing grease pencil objects and create a new Suzanne object by switching to object mode and then going to add grease pencil monkey. You can hit G and then Y to move the object a little bit away from camera. Now switch into edit mode and select all the strokes, and hit Shift and D to duplicate them, and then G and Y to move it in depth. Continue duplicating and moving the strokes until you have five or six sets of Suzanne strokes arranged at various depths beyond our original strokes. After this process, you should still only have one grease pencil object. The grease pencil strokes all appear stacked on top of each other because they're being depth sorted by 2D layer by default. To change this, we need to go into the options under the Strokes tab and change the Strokes depth order from 2D layers to 3D location. Now we're ready to start scripting. We'll change the right viewport to be a text editor and click the New button to create a new text file for our Python code. To access the Blender API, we'll import the BPY library. We'll also import the vector library from Matthew Tills, which we'll need for our distance calculations. For this script, we'll be calculating the depth of the strokes from the camera, so we'll want to make sure that at least one grease pencil and only one camera are selected. We start by fetching a list of selected objects, and then tease out which of those objects are grease pencils and which are cameras, and finally throw a bit of error checking in there to check the selection. 
In order to calculate the distance for each strokes, we'll also need a few functions. The first one is a function that calculates the distance between any two given positions. It takes two arguments, which are tuples, representing the two positions we are measuring. We convert each of these two positions to a vector object so that we can perform vector math on them. The math itself takes place in our return statement. We subtract the first vector from the second and call the built-in attribute of length on the resulting vector on the way out the door. Our next function is called getStrokePosition, which takes a grease pencil object and a stroke as an argument. Our function calculates the average 3D position of all the points in the stroke. We'll start by creating variables so that we can add up each of the stroke's points x, y, and z values. We'll also keep track of how many points are in each stroke. Next, we cycle through each point in the stroke and query its position. We get that point's world space position as a vector by extracting its local position from the overall grease pencil object's world matrix. With the world space position of the point, we then add its value to our variables for each channel, which gives us a running tally as we increment our num points counter. We then compute the average for each channel in our return statement by dividing each channel by the number of points. Note that we're wrapping up these values as a three-atom tuple, which represents the average position of the stroke points in the stroke. Finally, we need a function that calls the previous two functions to calculate our distance to the camera for each stroke. This function will take arguments for the camera position as a tuple, and a grease pencil object, and a stroke. First we call our getStrokePosition function and store the results in the strokePause variable. We then call our getDistance function passing the camera position and the stroke position, which we then return. With our functions in place, we're now ready to call them in the main body of our code. For each selected grease pencil object, we create an empty list to hold the depths for each stroke. We then tunnel down to the grease pencil's layers and frames. At the frame level, we'll get the camera's world space position by querying the translation attribute on its world matrix. Note that this syntax is a bit different than how we query the world space for the stroke points. This is because here we want the world space position of the entire object, as opposed to the subcomponents of the object. With the camera position in hand, we cycle through each of the strokes so that we can get the distance from the camera. We do this by calling our getDistanceToCamera function and passing in our camera position as well as a grease pencil object and the current stroke. We then append the results to our stroke distances list. To make sure our code is working thus far, we'll print out our distances. If we open up the console window, we can see the printout. These distances represent the distance to each stroke in our scene, in my case from about 15 meters to 95 meters, which seems about right. Now that we can calculate the depth of our strokes, we can start building the rest of our script. To do this, we'll start with the closest strokes to the camera and work our way back, stepping through the range. At each depth, we'll create a duplicate grease pencil object and remove any strokes that are not within the current range. We'll add some variables so that we can keep track of our min and max depths. Back down in the main code where we left off, we'll get rid of our print statement. In order to determine the bounds of our closest and furthest strokes, we simply call the built-in Python functions of min and max on our strokes distances list. Now we're ready to start creating our duplicates. First, we'll create a variable called step to control how big each depth range is. We'll give it a default value of 2 so that we create a new grease pencil object every 2 meters. We'll create an iterator variable i, and since we want to start counting our depths at the closest stroke to camera, we'll initialize it with the min depth. Now we'll loop through our strokes until we reach the farthest stroke in the grease pencil object. In our loop, we'll start by duplicating our grease pencil. Here we call a function called duplicate, which we'll create in a moment. Our duplicate function is one that I've shown in previous tutorials, so I won't go over it in too much detail here, but basically it allows us to duplicate the object, its data, and its animation, if any, and returns the duplicate object. Now that we have a duplicate object, we'll want to remove the strokes that lie outside the depth range of the current loop, so we'll cycle through each of the duplicate layers, frames, and strokes, and get the stroke depth by using the same get distance to camera as we did before. If the depth of a stroke lies outside the range we're currently on, it removes the stroke by calling the frame strokes remove function. If we run it now, we should be getting duplicate grease pencil objects every two meters, but there's a bit of a problem here. So far, we've been blindly duplicating our grease pencil objects, regardless of whether there are even any strokes at the given depth range. To keep things tidy, let's remove any grease pencil objects that end up without any strokes in them. We'll create a variable to hold the number of grease pencil strokes in the grease pencil object, and then we'll cycle through the layers and frames and get the number of strokes in each frame by calling the length function on the frame.strokes attribute. 
If the number of strokes is zero, then we'll remove that grease pencil duplicate by calling the remove function on bpy.data.objects. Now if we run it, we should only get duplicate grease pencil objects if it actually contains strokes. Now we're finally ready to add our blur effect to our remaining grease pencil objects. We create the new shader effect by calling the new function on the grease pencil object's shader effects attribute. The first argument here will be an arbitrary name, and the second argument is the type of effect we want to add. In this case, effects underscore blur, all caps. Next we need to activate the depth of field option on the blur effect by setting the use doff mode attribute to true. While we're in here, we might as well also increase the samples to 16 to get a nicer look. And that's it, we're ready to run the code. Remember, you'll need to use the full render mode and turn on depth of field on the camera as well. If we now look through the camera, we should see the blur effect in action. The blur is being applied to the grease pencil, but it seems to be the same amount of blur throughout the scene instead of the true depth of field effect. Earlier we had seen that the shader effect only applies to individual grease pencil objects, and now we've broken out our strokes into individual grease pencil objects, so why is it not working? Well, while it's true that the blur effect only applies to the entire grease pencil object, more specifically, it applies the effect at the object's origin point. We duplicated our original grease pencil, so all of our objects have the same origin point as the original, even though the strokes now lie at different depths. Thankfully, we can fix that. In order to get the depth of field effect to work correctly, we need to move the origin of our new grease pencil objects to be at the center of the strokes for that object. Moving the origin of the objects is a two-step process. First, we have to move the components of our object, in this case it's our grease pencil stroke points, to the current origin of the object, and then we move the entire object by the inverse amount. After doing so, our strokes end up back where they started, just with the origin at their center. Since we'll be repeating this over and over, let's create a new function called center origin, into which we'll pass a grease pencil object. To start with, we'll want to define where we want our new origin to be. The most logical position for this is at the center position of all the strokes in the object. To calculate this, we'll define the variables that hold a running total of all the strokes' positions, as well as the overall number of strokes. We'll then cycle through the strokes in the object, sum up their positions, and calculate the average as we assign it to a variable called new origin. This approach is nearly identical to the approach we took in the get stroke position function, except that this time we're calculating it at the stroke level rather than the point level. Next we need to get the current origin of our grease pencil object. This is super simple. We just query the grease pencil object's matrix world dot translation. With these two values in hand, we compute the offset by simply subtracting the new origin position from the current origin position. And now that we know how much offset is required to move our origin, we're ready to do the two steps that actually change the origin. First, we need to move each of the points in our stroke by the offset. We once again tunnel down to the stroke points for each stroke and set a new position for them, which is their current position plus the offset position for each of the three translation attributes. In the second step, we need to now move the object as a whole by the inverse of the offset. So we'll set the grease pencil object by its current location minus the offset per translation attribute. Back in the main part of our code, we'll add a call to our new function and pass in our duplicate grease pencil object. Before we run it, we'll also need to do one little bit of housekeeping. We're preserving the original grease pencil object to make the script non-destructive, but we'll want to hide it. So we'll set the hide viewport and hide render attributes to true on the grease pencil object. With all that, we should be good to run the script. If we haven't made any mistakes, we should now get all of our new grease pencil objects with each one's origin at the center of its stroke. If we turn on full rendering and adjust our depth of field settings on the camera, we should now see the depth of field effect being added properly. Our script has helped us automate our way around some of the limitations of the current implementation of Grease Pencil's depth of field, but it doesn't get around all of them. One limitation it's currently not possible to work around has to do with how Blender's shader effect deals with object depth. Blender's shader effect only takes into account the object's pivot when computing the depth of field. But if you like to use grease pencil objects in more of a 3D way, the depth of field might not calculate as you'd expect, especially if your object extends deeply away from the camera. Hopefully grease pencil objects will work with Blender's standard depth of field in the future versions, but until then this gives us a reasonable alternative. If you like this content, please like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.